everyone, my name is Jeffrey Pereira, and today I'm here at the Stanford University School of Medicine with Dr. Rogelio Hernandez Lopez. Um, he is the Assistant Professor of Bioengineering and Genetics here at Stanford and recently founded his very own research lab that focuses on optimizing engineered T cells in the context of cancer. Dr. Rogelio Hernandez, it is a pleasure to meet you in person, and I'm excited to hear your story. So, who are you, and what do you do? Thanks. Thanks for the invite, Jeffrey. Um, I'm a researcher. I'm a scientist and I'm a cell engineer. I work on engineering novel cellular therapies, uh, in particular for uh, cancer immunotherapy. Take me back to your life in Mexico, from your childhood to studying chemistry at the UNAM. Tell me your most defining moments during this period. It's a very good question. And actually, I would say I think I decided to become a scientist before going to college. You know, like I, I think for me something very transformative was participating in the uh, science Olympiads. I did uh, the chemistry science Olympiad, so when I was in high school, and for me I had that opportunity to meet other very amazing friends, cool people who were also interested in in science and discovering new things and learning, and I also had the opportunity to. Even though I was a high school student growing up in the south of Mexico in Oaxaca, I had the opportunity to go to UNAM, uh, to the largest university in Latin America, and meet uh, a bunch of scientists uh, who were training us no, for uh, these uh, science competitions. But more than like learning new things, I think it was the idea to be in an environment where everybody loves to learn and loves to discover new things and understand how the world uh, works. Who or what specifically inspired you to pursue the sciences? Yeah, that's that's also, I think that is being a collection of people. I, I don't think I, I can define anyone in particular, but like for sure my professors and like mentors, trainers during high school, I think they were people who really, really inspired me. You know, I, I challenged me to, to learn more and uh, my friends, my family, of course, I think I have always had the opportunity to pursue my dreams and pursue my interests so, and, and they have been really, really supportive. No? And then during college and, and later on also, I've been very lucky to have uh, mentors, professors who have supported my career. Yeah. So a lot of the research you do is regarding engineered T-cells um, and CAR T-cells are a big keyword in, in, in the field of immunology and, and engineering T-cells. For those out there who might not know, what are CAR T cells and, and why are they such a huge prospect in cancer immunotherapy? Yeah, that's also a very cool question and that's something I'm very fascinated about. Um, well, it, it turns out that with the research of many, many people and, and groups over the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years, uh, we have realized that we can repurpose not the function of these T cells that already defend us against virus, bacteria, so they are surveilling our bodies, no? And, but now we can use that ability of like making these identification processes and, and launching these very powerful killing activities, but for the case of killing cancer cells. Um, so we use methods of synthetic biology and synthetic receptors that allow these T cells to now identify uh, cancer cells. And upon that identification, then um, launch killing programs that will ultimately you not know, get rid of the cancer cells and, and there is a lot of excitement because for the case of liquid tumors, um, blood cancers such as lymphoma and leukemia, this has worked uh, remarkably well. No? Um, people who in the past uh, have failed chemotherapy or uh, bone marrow transplant now um, are getting uh, a very, very, very uh, decent remission rates with uh, this approach. So there's a lot of excitement of trying to use the same idea, the same approaches, but now this time to um, treat solid tumors. So there obviously is a promising future for CAR T-cells and re-engineering T-cells for therapeutic benefit, right? What exactly are the drawbacks to CAR T-cells? Yeah, that's also something that is, uh, there is many, many, things that even though um, it's very promising, in order to use this technology or this approach uh, against solid tumors, there is problems such as poor infiltration or exhaustion of these T-cells. Um, even though they, at the beginning, can start killing the, the tumor cells over time, you not know, like these T-cells get, get exhausted or uh, they die, they don't proliferate enough. So 
trying to control those behaviors is uh, a set of problems that there is many groups, including mine, um, that we're trying to solve. The other one, and that was part of my research uh, during my postdoc, is how can we make these T cells very, very specific to only cancer cells? No, even though um, we have heard uh, about cancer cells have like proliferation rates that are faster than normal cells, or they express here and there few proteins that are different between cancer cells and normal tissue. Still, there is very few features that are make very distinctive not cancer cells from from normal tissue. So um, for CAR T cells to really work, we need to engineer that specificity or like a higher order computation um, so that they can really distinguish or discriminate cancer cells from normal tissue. So what would you say is the future of cancer immunotherapy and where do you see your lab um, going in the next decade or so? Yeah, that's another, I think that um, the future is gonna be hopefully, you know, we're gonna figure out how to produce very specific and persistent uh, T cells. Uh, hopefully also we're gonna figure out ways to engineer them uh, more efficiently and more cheaply because at the moment uh, this approach, um, it's even though it's personalized medicine, is super, super expensive. So as you could imagine, um, the access of these technologies for just the widespread population is still very limited. So I am hopeful now that through the work of many, many groups, including mine, we can find new ways to engineer these cells, program them in, in smarter, uh, more efficient ways and um, really uh, bring these new technologies and approaches to, to the masses or the widespread usage of the, this new approach. What would you say is your guilty pleasure? Uh, I really love uh, 80s movies, not like Back to the Future, or like uh, Planet of the Apes and I don't know, like Rockies. I have watched all of them multiple times. So <laughs> I think growing up, uh, yeah, I would spend like Saturdays or Sundays just watching one after the other. So that's something that I probably I still enjoy nowadays. Yeah, I'm an absolutely terrible dancer, but <laughs> someone told me that you love salsa dancing. Would you be down to teach me a few steps? <laughs> I can probably teach you one or two, but uh, something that I, let me let me just tell you like this little story. I even though like contrary to what like people will think about oh man, I, I grew up in Mexico and uh, many people think oh you must know how to dance I think that is not true no, not everybody in Mexico no, or uh, in Latin America knows how to dance and it was my case uh, but before actually starting grad school while I was uh, training for the GRE I had like a little bit of extra time and I thought oh I should probably find like a way to distract myself no I cannot like uh, be studying all the time. So I started taking um, dancing classes and I really love it. So I really hooked, uh, got hooked into uh, the salsa dancing. So that was back in Mexico, like probably maybe eight or 10 months before I started grad school. So when I moved to, to Boston, so I look for classes. So I really pick that up as a hobby. And that's something that now Every time I travel for either vacation or for conferences, I try to look for a place to, to go salsa dancing. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for the most basic uh, step in salsa is an eight count. Okay. So you start with your left foot to the front. Uh, so one, one two in two, place, three, three, then pause. Okay. That's four. And then five, five six, six, seven, eight. eight. Another pause. Okay. So again, like it is one, one two, two, three, three pause, five, five six, six, seven, pause. pause. Okay. So that's the gotcha. basic step. So okay. everything in salsa happens with that count. And you could do then forward and backward, or you could do side steps, but follow okay. the same logic. Okay. You know? What is one moment when you realize you made the right career choice? That's also another interesting but difficult question to answer. I feel that, that I have had many times you know, where I have thought, oh, this is, this is what I want to do. This is what um, I would like to continue doing, not like the rest of my life. Like from the moment of learning something new, you no, know, and that could be like even from the books or, or from a peer or from a professor, but also when you realize, or when I have realized you know, a couple of times during my career that Oh, this is the first time probably someone has seen this, no? Um, and I'm 
probably one or the only handful of people who know this concept or I have made a discovery. That's something that I think is super, super rewarding, you know, and um, that doesn't happen like very often and probably more often than than others. You have a lot of challenges and problems and uh, things that you have to troubleshoot. But, but I think regardless of those moments, like these key moments when you say, ah, no, th this is very cool. Oh, I, th this is the first time I see this or, oh, I didn't think about that. I wonder if, I wonder if this means that, so I think those moments are something really cool about being a scientist and do science. In the rawest form, what is it like being an immigrant in the science world? Um, that's also a very good question. I feel that it's a process of constant learning and I don't know what would be the correct analogy. Maybe traveling to a new country where, which is part of not being an immigrant, where you are slowly learning to speak the language, you are trying to figure out what the signs mean, you know, how you navigate, you know, like, I don't know, taking a bus or going to the subway, you know, or going from point A to point B. I think there is a constant learning process and that's something that for sure is challenging, but also is like very fun to explore, to navigate. So there is a constant process of exploring and learning that that's something that I, I really enjoy. Um, I think also the same idea of traveling that you bring the knowledge and the experiences uh, with which you grew up. So that contributes not like to this learning process or how you approach uh, this learning process of navigating the science and the science world in, in a different country. Yeah. Now, how would you say that your multicultural background has helped you as a scientist? I think by giving me a different perspective, you no, know, in terms of how things are done in in one country versus another, for example, I mean something that um, I think I got a very very good uh, training back in Mexico. I learned a lot, but I learned probably from the books. I had to study a lot from the books. And something that I realized when I moved to the U.S. is that now you have access to all this equipment and people and, and technology, and but you can use all that knowledge, you know, now to put it into practice. And um, I think also learning how to do science with a fewer resources and in, it, it, that also for sure kind of pushes you to be more creative, you no, know, in, in how to solve a problem, how to. Uh, try to be more efficient. So um, I think that's that's how I can see uh, that as an advantage. You know, the other uh, just connecting to with multiple people. I think that uh, I can understand a little bit of what it means to move from you not know, your home country to a new place to learn the language to maybe miss family and, and home. You no. Know? Um, and that helped me to connect also with different type of people. For of course, people from Latin America who speak the same language, so I can connect also in the scientific aspect, but also in the personal aspect. What would you say you miss the most about you know leaving your home country, Mexico? Uh, for sure, the family, family, and the food. Well, even though now that I'm in California, I can find much better tacos and much better, you no know, like uh, uh, things that I will eat back home. Um, just being far, I guess, from family, yeah, from like these constant reunions of like, or birthdays, no, or parties, no. That's that's something that I miss. I, I've been also very lucky and fortunate to have created a group of friends and and people who now I consider my family here. So, uh, um, but yeah, I think uh, that that's what I miss the most. When I say the word mentor. Who comes to mind and what would you say is the most valuable thing you learned from them? Yeah, mentors are those people who they know what to say in the right moment. No? And it could be the moments when you really need someone to cheer you up, but also people who are encouraging and pushing you. you know? uh, I uh, Growing up, I was, um, uh, before actually I entered science, I was a swimmer and I feel a competitive swimmer. So I, at that time, no, like my mentors were my trainers, no, and and the role or the job of 
my mentors and trainers were like to push me, no, like to to be faster, to be stronger, no, and and. I think in science there is a little bit of that also like the role of the mentors is to try to guide you and to teach you but also um, give you the enough freedom so that you pursue your interests and, and achieve your goals and my mentors in college in during my PhD and my postdoc have been great at that in their own style and their own like skills I have always had the opportunity to pursue my interests and um, they have always been there to support me when I needed them. So, yeah. So was there, you mentioned that you were once a competitive swimmer. Was there ever a conflict of interest between you wanting to pursue being a swimmer for as a career versus you wanting to be a scientist uh, for the rest of your life? I think that happened for me exactly in high school. Um, there was a point where I was trying to do a little bit of both still uh, continue doing my t trainings, no, which were like three hours every day, you know, plus maybe Saturday, sometimes Sundays. And so I, at some point I had to decide whether to continue on that or maybe just say, no, I actually want to dedicate, no, like time um, to study, you know, or to do other type of training. So because I started swimming when I was uh, a kid, no, like uh, I think I had a good run from when I was nine to 15, 16 years. So at that point, like I was not the tallest, so I was not the strongest. So I thought also, oh, probably I won't have like a, a, a very long career uh, as a swimmer. So yeah, I just uh, decided to dedicate myself to, to science. So yeah, starting a lab, I mean, you recently did this past May is, especially at Stanford, is a remarkable achievement in itself. How would you say that you set yourself up to achieve so greatly? I don't, I don't think I ever thought, oh, I want to be a professor at Stanford. No, mm -hmm. like, I, I think that's something that I have always tried to plan just the next step. And then I have like, okay, I want to be a professor. And that's something that I think I decide pretty early on in my career, but I didn't know where or how, but I just, um, during my PhD and postdoc, I tried to pursue the questions that I thought were were interesting. The and when I went to the job market, no, I, I just tried to do as best as I can. Try to learn from others who have gone through the process. Try to go to workshops, not to learn like what is it about to be a professor. And uh, it was quite of a, an experience and a learning process from the moment where I decided. Yes, I'm applying this year to going through a process of interviewing and like presenting what ideas I was going to come up with for my own lab for the future. Um, yeah, I learned a lot and I'm just like very uh, grateful, I guess, that things work out for me. Yeah. So with your new lab, I mean, there are a lot of other T-cell um, engineering or re-engineering T-cell labs and, and cancer immunotherapy labs. What new approaches do you think your lab will bring to the table? That's a very good question. Um, I've been trying to think particularly in the concept of cell-cell communication. Um, so I think there is right now a lot of research on trying to select a cell, for example, a T-cell or a macrophage or a B-cell, no? um, and engineer multiple functions to, into that single cell. And something that I'm like really curious and I'm trying to explore in my own lab is what if rather than engineering a single cell, now we engineer communities of cells, no? and, and we need to engineer cell-cell communication. And I am particularly excited about um, the microbiome and the immune system interactions. So how can we perhaps use uh, microbes that live in your gut or your skin or within the tumor microenvironment to talk to immune cells and perhaps potentiate their activity or make them persist for longer um, or don't get exhausted. So I am thinking about engineering cell-cell communication as opposed to a single cell. That's wonderful. So what advice would you give to the up-and-coming generation of scientists or, or people that would want to start their own lab at Stanford one day? I guess my advice is, sure, think about that big goal, but also think about in the immediate things that you have to do, which is enjoy science. and um talk to a lot of people no i think that something that i 
enjoy a lot from being a scientist is having the opportunity to interact with people from your field, from different fields, no? learn from each other. I think this part of like the peer interactions are very, very important. And uh, yeah, my advice is don't be afraid of asking questions. No, people will, I think for the most part, like when you reach out, people will answer, no? and, and there is enough people out there willing to share their um, experiences and their perspectives. So there is a lot of value on asking questions about anything science or career or mentoring relationships, I think. Um, asking is very important. Thank you so much, Dr. Hernandez Lopez. It was it was great meeting you and I loved hearing your story. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. All right.